You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 31st, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, allergic rhinitis. Our presenter is Dr. Brooke Polk. She's the Associate Program Director in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, good morning, everyone. This is the second hour of COLA for August 31st, 2020. Um, our second talk this morning um, is on allergic rhinitis, and, and our speaker this morning is Dr. Brooke Polk. Um, Dr. Polk um, is a former fellow of ours here at Children's Mercy, so we're very proud of her. Um, she has gone on to start her career at um, Washington University in St. Louis, works at St. Children's uh, or St. Louis Children's Hospital and um, is also the associate program director there. So um, I am very pleased that she took time out of her busy schedule this morning to talk to us. So Brooke, I'll let you take it away. All right. Thanks, Dr. Dowling. Um, thanks for having me today. It's good to be with you guys. I know that the topic um, of allergic rhinitis is typically not one that's thought to be particularly exciting, but it is the majority of the patients whom we see, so it's important to know a little bit about it. So I tried to sprinkle in some fun facts um, and just kind of some interesting aspects of allergic rhinitis that we as allergists should be familiar with um, and also just kind of general good practices to have. So to start off, I do not have any disclosures for this talk. Um, at least a few years ago when I was in COLA, we had a few kind of clinical questions to go through and try to answer by the end of the talk. So I have three of those. The first one is you are seeing a 32-year-old patient with perennial allergic rhinitis who is poorly controlled on fluticasone nasal monotherapy. Which medication should you recommend he add? And those are your four choices there. The second, and this one is probably a little more in the forefront right now uh, with a recent change to its labeling, but a five-year-old boy developed severe aggression after starting a new allergy medication, which one is likely to blame? And question three, a little oral allergy symptom question. So an individual who has started to complain of itchy hands when peeling potatoes and throat itching when eating tomato, what is the most likely pollen culprit? So our objectives today, one, is to review the pathophysiology of allergic rhinitis, which is fairly similar to the pathophysiology of many of our Th2-mediated processes, uh, to briefly review the exposome and the hygiene hypothesis, which I think are super cool, and to discuss diagnostic and treatment methods for allergic rhinitis. And so to start, we will define allergic rhinitis because, you know, it's kind of the reason we're giving the talk. So rhinitis is characterized by one or more of the following. Congestion either anterior or posterior rhinorrhea, sneezing, or nasal itching. It's generally, but not always, inflammatory, and it kind of breaks down into one-third allergic, one-third non-allergic, and one-third mixed, so these people who have allergic triggers and vasomotor or irritant or other triggers. It's, we don't have clear-cut guidelines like we do with asthma for kind of what is intermittent and what is persistent, um, but this is from the ARIA guidelines uh, from a couple years ago, which is pretty helpful to either define intermittent or persistent as whether or not it affects you more or less than half the week or for more, for greater or less than four weeks in a row. And then mild versus moderate severe is really whether or not your allergic rhinitis interferes with your life or your daily living. Rhinitis can be seasonal or perennial. It can be perennial with seasonal exacerbations. It can be episodic after a large volume allergen exposure. And when it comes to billing for allergic rhinitis, there all of these things are important because you want to be as detailed as you possibly can. Allergic rhinitis is pretty common, has a physician diagnosed prevalence of 13% of children and 14% of adults. Um, the prevalence is slowly climbing. And as we know, you know, we don't probably see everybody in clinic who has allergic rhinitis. So the actual prevalence is probably a bit higher. And interestingly, the WHO has posited that half of the global population will have an allergic disease by 2050. So I thought that was a very interesting fact. Um, and although sometimes, you know, we disregard this as trivial because it's not a life-threatening diagnosis, it can significantly impact quality of life. You know, we have people 
seeing us during a global pandemic for their allergic rhinitis. So clearly this is affecting them enough to seek medical care. It can affect sleep, attention, memory, and productivity. And over 80% of patients with allergic rhinitis report poor sleep quality. This was a study done by AFA in 2010, kind of taking a look at 16 million physician visits and found that the United States spent $17.5 billion on allergic rhinitis-related health costs, which I find staggering. So this axis looks at mean productivity loss per employee, so these were adults, um, and looking at kind of how much they kind of cost the system, essentially. Um, and then this side is just looking at different diagnoses here. And I know you see lots of these studies with different diagnoses always taking the top one, depending on what they're looking at, but this one was very interesting in that allergic rhinitis and hay fever were way up here. And most of that burden was related to indirect health costs of, you know, absenteeism and presenteeism, which is working while you're sick. The next thing to define is what is an allergen. Um, and so an allergen is an allergen generating an allergy generating substance and there are 988 of them officially recognized by the WHO IUIS nomenclature subcommittee and this is up 40 uh, from 2019 so there are new allergens being discovered all the time and the way that we typically describe them and even on the Quad AI's website and other websites right now is we describe allergens as otherwise harmless things and I think, you know, that you might want to think about them a little bit differently because various plant and animal allergens actually really do interact with the innate immune system in a way that can be very inflammatory. And so one thing to note is that TLR4 and Dectin are both big players in this, which can lead to inflammation. Allergens utilize defensins, phospholipase A2, you know, when we're studying stinging insects, we talk about all of these hyaluronidases and phospholipases, but these are actually involved in allergic rhinitis as well. We just don't kind of talk about them as much, kind of like that. DER-P2, uh, which is from a dust mite, is a structural homolog of MD2, which is your TLR4 co-receptor responsible for binding LPS. And then Dectin-2 on dendritic cells binds glycans and dust mites and aspergillus which induces the glutrine production. So there's definitely, you know, some innate immunity at play in our response to allergens. And when you think about them, know that most allergens belong to a very small subset of protein families, and so their biologic function is likely connected to their allergenicity in some way. What we're unclear about is why only certain people mount this response to allergens. And we know that it's likely somewhere in the innate immune system. And so there is a, a response in allergic rhinitis individuals who have altered signal processing or mutations of pattern recognition receptors or other innate immune players. So we know people with allergic rhinitis have trouble with Dectin-1, which is a pattern recognition receptor expressed by phagocytes. It blocks IL-33 and suppresses the Th2 pathway. And there was a study last year in asthmatic patients that showed that their dectin-1 doesn't interact properly with allergens. And we also know that the dendritic cells of people who have ATP respond differently to BETV1 than those who don't have a birch allergy. So there's definitely some interesting things that we are still figuring out about this. You know, we need to learn more about the structure of allergens, how they affect the innate immune system, and kind of where that susceptibility to sensitization occurs. We have to have a couple of slides with the TH2 pathway just to belabor this into your minds. So we have an understanding of the general process by which allergens lead to TH2 inflammation, right? So you have your dendritic cell up here or another antigen presenting cell and it presents your antigen to your naive CD4 positive T cell by MHC2. And those T cells will differentiate into a TH2 cell and they will release IL, where are you? IL5 right here which stimulates eosinophil production and recruitment. And they will also release IL-4 and 13 over here. And we know um, that IL-4 helps with isotype switching of B cells to secrete IgE, um, along with the CD40, CD40 ligand code signal. Um, and then downstream, you have these mediators, which we will definitely talk about. So after you become sensitized, um, once the allergen is seen, again, your IgE binds via the FAB portion, and it cross-links your IgE receptors, uh, which are FC epsilon R1s, on your sensitized mast cells and basophils via the FC portion, and that leads to degranulation, right? 
Uh, fun fact, the nasal epithelia of allergic patients has 50 times more mast cells than non-allergic subjects, which I found to be quite interesting. Um, downstream effects of these mediators, you could vasodilation, so permeability, you have activation of nearby nerves, which leads to a sneeze reflex, um, glands lead to secretion, all kinds of products. So the main mediator that we think about most often is histamine. And histamine can actually cause all of the symptoms of allergic rhinitis if you spray histamine into the nose of a normal person, a volunteer who does not have rhinitis. It can cause bronchoconstriction, tissue edema, vascular permeability, and mucus secretion. But there are other mediators that we have to think about as well. So one is kind of the arachidonic acid pathway, which you must know for your boards and futures. So here's a nice picture from Middleton's. Um, so IgE cross-linking activates phospholipase A2, this guy right here, which releases arachidonic acid. It can either be metabolized by the Cox pathway over here into prostaglandins or by the 5-lipoxygenase pathway over here into your leukotrienes, and they all have their nice little letters and numbers. A few that are important, uh, PGD2 is vasodilatory. It is more potent than histamine in causing congestion, and it has some important receptors, DP1 and DP2, one of which is also called CRTH2. Um, LTB4 is a very potent chemotactic factor in humans. And then your leukotriene C4 and D4 cause tissue edema, mucus secretion, enhances your IL-13 pathway, um, and has receptors cis-LT1 and LT2, which are important for your medications. I don't know why this picture is backwards, so bear with me here. So the phases of allergic inflammation, early phases over here on the right, um, kind of read it this way. So for your early phase, what you are looking at basically is preformed mediators within a mast cell that get spit out um, and kind of do their damage very quickly within minutes. So this is kind of your sneezing and your runny nose. Late phase, after some time, you have recruitment of cells like basos, EOs, TH2s. This takes hours, involves tissue remodeling, and leads to persistent congestion. And so once you're in this late phase, your tissue is primed for future allergen, and you're kind of hyper-reactive at that time to other allergens as well. Next slide is a little intense, so don't focus on it too much. It's just showing you that there are a lot of different pieces at play here between the innate and the adaptive immune systems. A few things to focus on in this picture, I put these little teal stars this first one up here, this is your airway up here, um, and this is your tissue in here. And so what you are looking at right here, what it's trying to show you is that your barrier is just a little bit leaky. You know, as we think of with atopic dermatitis, you have a leaky barrier, which allows your allergen in. Your What we typically think of as upstream guys, TSLP, IL-25, and IL-33 are involved with your leaky airway epithelium. They go on to first interact with your innate lymphocyte cell type 2, or your ILC2s, and this is your earliest producer of your TH2 cytokines, all right? And they are involved in TNB cell activation. And then another thing to look at over here, we have T regulatory cells and B regulatory cells actually as well. Those help control allergic inflammation and are, are involved in cellular activation via IL-10 and TGF beta. Stay with me. So, ILC2s are significantly increased in the nasal mucosa of people with allergic rhinitis, and they possess a lot of important receptors, things that we have talked about or briefly mentioned. So, an IL-33 receptor, cis-LT1 receptor, CRTH2 receptor for prostaglandins, and so once all of these things are bound, they release TH2 cytokines. Your regulatory friends are very important in immune tolerance. So your T regs produce IL-10 and TGF beta. And then we also have B regs, which were just becoming discovered when I was in fellowship. So we're learning a little bit more about them now. Um, they produce IL-10 and they're also important in suppressing T response and promoting IgG4 antibodies. And allergen immunotherapy really focuses on this process, which we will touch on a little bit if we have time. This next slide I think is super cool. So this is the neural response in ATP, which within the last two, three years has really started to become something that is being focused on in research. So there is crosstalk between neural cells in the immune system, which forms this neural immune network. 
And what is happening here is there are pro-inflammatory interleukins, and they activate sensory neurons, which are responsible for itch and cough and sneezing and bronchoconstriction and many other things. It's very cool in the pathophysiology of atopic derm, especially because they are finding drugs that actually target the itch response, because we know antihistamines are not great at the itch in atopic derm, um, but an IL-31 antibody, JAK inhibitors are being helpful for this. What you see in this photo here is it's just showing you how close the nerves, which are the SNAP25, which are the green here, are relative to your ILC, ILC2 cells, which are the red right here. So I thought that was pretty cool. CD3 is also stained for down here in blue, so a few kind of T cells, but your ILC2s are CD3 negative, so they're not going to be blue. Sensory neurons release a lot of different substances, especially substance P, neurokinin A, NMU, uh, which form this feedback loop with your ILC2 cells that become pro-inflammatory when they're exposed to these things. And so this just came out in Nature a couple months ago looking at this network in various situations. So what we are looking at here in allergy is that when your nerves are activated, essentially they release VIP which is vasoactive intestinal peptide. It binds to the VIP receptor on your ILC2 cells, which spit out IL-5, which activates the nerve to make more VIP. So you have this like little loop over here, um, which perpetuates allergy in the Th2 pathway. Your nerves, kind of the, I think the proprioceptive nerves also spit out CGRP, which also activates ILC2s to make IL-5. This middle picture is just looking at what happens if you have a bacterial infection or if you have a parasitic infection over here, and that's when this neuromede in you or NMU really becomes more involved. Um, but I just think it's really neat. Switching focus a little bit um, in terms of other factors that affect allergic rhinitis is this exposome. And so this is another big field of study right now, and the exposome is the measure of all of the exposures of an individual in a lifetime and how those exposures relate to health. And so people are trying to figure out right now, you know, what are the modifiable environmental factors that contribute to ATP and what is the epigenetic impact of those factors as it relates to ATP. So here are a bunch of different environmental factors that are being studied, how they affect the epigenome and then the genome, and then you have all of your omics, which have very long, complicated names, but here are some of them and then looking at how does that affect your internal exosome and what is the outcome of that. So there are many different parts at play. I think we're all familiar with the hygiene hypothesis, which essentially states that there's an association between these developed countries' lifestyle changes, like improved sanitation and infection control and the use of antibiotics and this concept of an under-challenged or altered immune system. It just hasn't seen enough yet, so you're susceptible to these allergic conditions. There is an immunologic basis for this hypothesis, and so at least in mice, if they make them MyD88 deficient, so they have impaired TLR responses, they're very skewed to a Th2 response because they don't have that kind of Th1 stimulus. And the hypothesis is that a greater microbial burden or greater diversity has a protective influence on allergy development. So this leads to this biodiversity hypothesis, which states that fewer germs early in life is bad uh, for ATP in general. The kind of prototypical example of looking at this is bacterial endotoxin, which is the TLR4 ligand and a marker of microbial exposure. They have found that less of this is bad in murine studies and a high amount is protective as it's skewed toward a Th1 response. And this has recently been shown to be true in humans as well. And there's some evidence that points to why some are more sensitive and some aren't. And so this is just arising recently. One thing that was looked at is the CD14, which we know is a co-receptor for TLR4, which binds LPS. And so you will be familiar with that pathway if you are not yet um, by the end of the last studies. So that's all I've got on that. In terms of other external exposures, there was a 2015 meta-analysis that showed that increased exposure to traffic-related pollution is associated with sensitization in ATP, and there's other studies looking at other particulate matter, even like nanoparticles are being evaluated. So pretty much anything in the air can help predispose you to allergens. And as we know, you know, what is outside does not stay outside. It definitely comes in and then a little bit of what is in goes out. Um, but for the most part, we're looking at kind of outside things. And 
one thing that I thought was interesting is that they even looked at climate change in this, and the thought process behind that was that um, heat waves have been shown to alter the seasonality and pollen concentration, which can actually affect allergic rhinitis. So indoor, um, in terms of allergens that we typically think about, there's not a lot of good convincing data out there to tell you, you know, is a pet protective or not? You know, some studies say, you know, having a dog early in infancy can be protective. Having a cat is bad. Having a dog later is bad. There's no great recommendations there. In terms of house dust mite, there have been studies that have shown that no dust mite is good, that a lot of dust mite is good because it challenges baby's immune system, and that intermediate levels are bad, but how do you measure that and what are you going to do? There's really not any any great data to show that one particular exposure is necessarily bad or predisposing to allergy. They did find, at least with mold, that, you know, with most other things, a greater fungal diversity is a protective thing. The host microbiome is another fascinating um, area of study, and so this is just kind of your natural microbial communities in your airway and your GI tract and your skin, etc. We all know that you know, there is more microbial DNA within your host of a human body than there is human DNA, and that has to have something to do with what is going on inside of you. So there are tons of studies that show that an altered microbiome precedes allergic sensitization and Th2 inflammation. And so a big study showed that there is reduced gut microbial diversity at age one month. Um, if you have that, it's predictive of eczema at age two and allergic rhinitis at age six. And they took a look at what are the bugs, essentially, that are in atopic children's guts versus non-atopic children's guts. And these bifidobacteria and bacteroides and lactobacilli and the things that we typically think of as probiotics or good guys are found less often in individuals with ATP. And more often, you find things like clostridia, staph, and yeast. There are quite a few factors that could have a role in this, such as breastfeeding. Are you born via C-section or vaginally? What did your mom eat? Did you get antibiotics early on? Have you been exposed to pets or tobacco? You name it. And it's not only in the gut, but also the nasopharynx. The microbiome is very different in infants who have ATP versus those who don't. And if they have a particular microbiome, it impacts the severity of lower respiratory infection and risk of asthma later in life. And so the big question is, is there a critical window? What do we do about it? Does this actually predict anything, or is this just a marker of early immune dysregulation? And right now, we don't know. I think that epigenetics definitely have a role in allergic rhinitis and allergic sensitization in general. And so when we think about epigenetics, you know, epi is kind of upon the gene. So we are looking at environmentally caused alterations in gene expression without actually changing the DNA. So we're talking about things like adding a little methyl group to a CPG. And so if you stick a methyl group on there, you are going to inactivate a gene. If you take a methyl group off, you're going to turn on the gene. Another acetylation of core histones. And so if you acetylate a histone, put a little acetyl group on there, it's going to turn on a gene. If you take it off, it's going to turn it off. And so kind of opposite effects of these two things. And these are affected by development and environmental kind of chemicals, drugs, aging, diet. All kinds of things can affect this. When you acetylate your histones, it plays a very important role in regulating inflammation. And this holds true for allergy, which is really interesting. So you have a marked increase in histone deacetylase, or HDAC, activity in patients with allergic rhinitis. And it correlates inversely with epithelial integrity. So does this lead to that leaky barrier? Or is it a potential marker of injury? And we know that some of our Th2 cytokines seen here increase the activity of this enzyme and they contribute to leakiness of your barrier. We also know that macrophages respond differently to endotoxin. That's epigenetically controlled. And so is differentiation of your Th0 cells to your Th2 cells. So what happens is you activate or demethylate your IL-4 promoter, which allows IL-4 receptor activation and subsequent binding of STAT6 and GATA3 kind of activation of that T helper 2 pathway, which is super cool. And then you have other genes that are hypermethylated or turned off in ATP. So your interferon gamma, your FOXP3 genes. And so there's a really interesting mouse model of this. And so if they expose a mouse to DERP1, 
they actually passed on their hypermethylated genes to their offspring. And if they weren't exposed anymore, the FOXP3 promoter eventually normalized, and they eventually weren't atopic anymore, which was pretty interesting. They have done a big epigenome-wide meta-analysis that was published last year in Jackie, and they found some novel loci that are differentially methylated in newborns, which represent potential biomarkers of asthma by school age. This was reproduced in the Lancet um, and then recently in a communication from Nature as well. So I think there's something to it, but it's so new that there's not really any good, here's the biomarker, here's what we should look at. It's just this exists. And you can even use kind of a how methylated are your genes in your nose as a biomarker, which is really cool. One slide on microRNA, because you can't forget it if you talk about epigenetics. So these are non-coding tiny little dudes that interfere with gene expression by turning off mRNA. And just note that there are differences in people who have allergy versus people who don't, but I think we're all tired and done talking with these tiny micromolecular things, and let's talk about what we actually do in clinic when we see someone who we think has allergic rhinitis. So, I think we all have some good questions that we ask people who come with allergic rhinitis, right? So we want to know, what are your symptoms? What is the pattern? Is there any seasonality? Is there chronicity to this? You know, where are your symptoms worse? Are you better inside or outside or around pets or at home or at work or with air conditioning on or with a window open? You know, all these different things. Excuse me, that can affect people's noses. You want to know, you know, is there just an occupational exposure? What have they tried to feel better? Do they have any coexisting ATP such as asthma? Do they have OSA? Do they have GERD? Take a very good environmental history and a good family history. And so one thing that I think Dr. Dowling really teaches us very well is that itching is much more common in allergic rhinitis than non-allergic rhinitis, right? So if they don't itch, it's very unlikely that they have allergic rhinitis. And then something to note is that every weather change, if they say, you know, if it gets hot or it gets colder, it rains, my nose is runny for a few days. That's very different from having, you know, symptoms for a few weeks every spring or a few weeks every fall or, you know, a very seasonal component. In terms of asthma, we know that allergic rhinitis is an independent risk factor for the development of asthma in any study that you look at. Um, up to 78% of patients with asthma have allergic rhinitis, and many kids who have allergic rhinitis, even if they don't have asthma symptoms, will actually have bronchial hyperresponsiveness if you do pre and post PFTs. Asthma patients who have allergic rhinitis that is not well controlled tend to do more poorly than those who have well controlled rhinitis, independent of kind of other factors. And then when we learn about chronic rhinosinusitis, it's very difficult sometimes to really piece apart this definition of chronic rhinosinusitis versus the definition of allergic rhinitis, right? Um, because most people who have chronic rhinosinusitis have allergic rhinitis, about 80%. And so the pathophysiology in the acute is really puffy, and your sinuses are draining, then you're going to get anaerobic conditions and get acute sinusitis and antibiotics help you when you get better. Chronic is a little bit more involved and not as well understood, but definitely involves some of that acute pathway, but also in some people anti-staphylococcal IgE antibodies that play a role in this inflammation, which is pretty interesting. Um, and there's the page in Middleton's if you want to read more about that. Here is your prototypical allergic child. So this is a photo from Nate, and this poor kid has every single sign that we would look at externally to say, yeah, you probably have allergies. So the thing that parents tend to talk about the most are these allergic shiners, right, which is kind of the dark puffiness of the un the lower eyelid. I um, mean, that is just due to subcutaneous venodilation. And so if your kind of your capillaries and your venules are a little bit dilated, you're going to see a little bit more blood or kind of a darker color. Denny Morgan lines are kind of those accentuated lower lid folds. A transverse nasal crease is kind of that line right across the nose from repeated rubbing of the nose. And when the kid kind of rubs their hand up their nose, we call that the allergic salute. And then this kid has a very typical kind of adenoid or allergic face. And so he has a high palate, an open mouth. He can even get dental malocclusion. And if you look at the side view, 
you kind of have this open mouth, this small recessed lower jaw, and so these are all signs of, of allergy. If you look in the nose, you're going to see pale, boggy, and large nasal turbinates. You can see rhinorrhea or post-nasal drip. And then we often describe cobblestoning, which is essentially hyperplastic lymphoid tissue that lines the posterior pharynx. And there's not a great picture online. This is the best that I could find. So just kind of those big, bumpy, like cobblestone pathway type papillae back there. So in terms of evaluation, we have a few different ways that we can check uh, for sensitization to aeroallergens. And so skin prick testing is one that we do most often. Um, and it helps direct therapy and it helps with individualized aeroallergen minimization and avoidance recommendations. And so this percutaneous skin prick test is often our preferred method. And this we know can be affected by age, season, or medication use. And so the very young and the very old might have smaller reactions. Season, medication use might affect this. So definitely there are medicines that you need to hold before you do skin testing. In terms of sensitivity and specificity, it's about 80 to 85 percent compared with the gold standard, which is a nasal provocation test, which we don't typically do um, outside of research studies. For example, here was a research study that looked at intradermal testing. And so the main thing you need to know about intradermal testing relative to aero allergies is it doesn't typically help or do much. It doesn't really add to your evaluation. So this is a study kind of from the late 90s that took adult patients who thought that they were allergic to cat, and they evaluated them. They did a skin test, they did an intradermal if the skin test was negative, and they did a RAST test, and it was a RAST test at that time, followed by a cat challenge, which was being in a very small room with two cats and a blanket, um, and they took a look at the outcome of the challenge relative to their testing. So this is a skin test here. 38 out of 41 patients who had a positive skin test had a positive cat challenge, so that was a good test. And then most patients, 29 out of 39, who had a negative cat skin test, had a negative cat challenge. RAST over here performed fairly similarly. All 27 who had a positive RAST test had a positive cat challenge, so very good there. And then 32 out of 44 had a negative cat challenge if they had a negative RAST. So both the skin test and the blood test were pretty good. Intradermal, on the other hand, not great. And so if they had the negative skin test, remember they got this ID test. And so looking at positive, it was six out of 26 patients, or who, which is 24%. Okay, so not very good. And then nine out of, what is it, four out of 13, just not very good. Okay, so if you had an ID, the correlation was not fabulous and so the conclusion essentially was that once the subject was found to have a negative skin test they were just as likely to have a positive cat challenge if they had a negative or a positive intradermal so they said let's not do this and other studies have concluded the same thing in terms of specific IgE um, there are many reasons to consider this um, in lieu of the skin prick test you know if a patient is dermatographic if they have diffuse dermatitis and there's really no good area to test if they're not able to withhold any medications that interfere with your skin test you're going to do a blood draw in the united states this is performed as a fluorescent sandwich assay using paper immunochromatography which is called an immunocap and your results are going to be in kilo units per liter and in comparison with the skin test Sensitivity is about 75%, but specificity is typically thought to be a little bit better in a blood test versus a skin test. And they usually agree with each other 85 to 95% of the time. We don't often do a nasal allergen provocation, but it is something you should know just a little bit about for boards. Um, in the essence that there is some evidence for local nasal IgE production called n p um, in people who have convincing allergic rhinitis symptoms in a negative skin or blood test. Um, you don't really need to know this nasal cytology down here, it's just if you're interested. There are plenty of other tests that you will read about and see, and there's a whole Middleton's chapter on this, which I think is very interesting, but you know, all over social media, you'll see, send us your hair, or send us your spit, or we'll tell you everything you're sensitive to by looking at your iris, or hold this food, which one is heavier? It's, fascinating how many different things are out there, but none of them are validated. So just know that what we have talked about has validation and the rest of it, for the most part, does not. How do we treat this? Well, one thing that we know is that if you are sensitized to an aeroallergen, 
and you have significant accumulation of that allergen in your home, it's a very strong, actually the strongest risk factor for developing asthma in population or case control or prospective studies, you name it. Um, and so just being around what you are sensitized to can be a big risk factor for developing asthma. The single interventions necessarily are not often effective. So if you just do one thing to minimize aeroallergen exposure, it's not going to be the magic solution. But if you do multiple things together, it can definitely help. And so here is kind of a nice chart of some different things you can do to help minimize aeroallergen exposure. For example, I know you guys at Children's Mercy have an excellent handout on this. So this is kind of modified and taken from that. Um, but for pollen, You'll want to keep your windows closed, your air conditioner on, change your clothes and rinse your hands and your face after being outside for a long period of time if your pollen that you're allergic to is kind of out there. And please don't sleep in your pajamas. Take them off. Take a shower if you can. For mold, obviously, you know, for inside, you want to fix your water leaks. Try to get a dehumidifier to get the home humidity down and safely clean mold with dilute bleach. But you can also follow your mold spore counts online as well. For dust mites, it's important, you know, if you want to really help dust mites, you have to do multiple things. And so you have to get a mattress and a pillow and ideally a box spring encasement, wash your bedding once a week in hot water, reduce your indoor humidity, remove carpets from bedrooms. Getting a HEPA or an air filter is not going to be helpful in this situation because dust mites are not in the air. Um, so that's something to note as well. Um, for pets, in a perfect world, you would bathe your pet once a week. You actually have to bathe a cat at least once a week to reduce LD1 levels, but I don't know many cats who like baths, so that's really not super realistic. Um, but just trying to keep pets out of areas where kids spend a lot of time. And then cockroaches, you know, do your best to not leave food or trash out, store food properly, fix water leaks, and clean fact about dust mites is they survive by absorbing atmospheric humidity, uh, which is why you want to keep your humidity down in your home. Cat allergen can persist for months after you kind of rehome a cat. And so it's not like if you move a cat, your symptoms are going to get better right away because Feldy one is everywhere. Um, and then Feldy one and Can F1, I think we all know this, they differ from animal to animal, you know, from dog to dog or cat to cat and breed to breed, but there is no scientific literature to truly confirm the existence of a hypoallergenic breed. Um, there is a new kind of cat food out there. I don't know if you guys have seen it, um, but it is thought to decrease Feldy one levels and make people less sensitive. And so that's something that the scientific world is looking into. I don't think it's a perfect solution, but it has been shown to be a little bit helpful for some people. And then once I show people their kids' skin tests sometimes and they see that they're allergic, for example, to oak pollen, they say, oh my gosh, I have an oak tree, we have to cut it down. But note, this does not include cutting down your front yard oak tree because pollen travels for many miles um, and it's really probably not going to make a difference. So if parents or families or your adult patients want a way to track this, um, the best website is on the Quad AI, and Children's Mercy's data from the most recent date that was available, which I think was Friday, is right here. Um, and so this can kind of help families. You know, it's a little more specific than your weather app that just says trees are low, weeds are high, molds are high. It actually tells you which specific species or type of pollen or mold is out there. And something that I find very interesting, which maybe we can blame, you know, climate change or something is that there is still grass pollen out and it's almost September and grass is still moderate and I think that's crazy because grass pollen is supposed to be gone like three months ago um, but there is still moderate grass high weeds and we are in the very peak of mold season right now in the great state of Missouri so we have all kinds of mold out in the air. So what else can we do? Um, you know, in addition to let's minimize our exposure to aeroallergens, we can't necessarily minimize our exposure to all of these other things in the exposome, but we can try. So from a microbiome perspective, you know, we do immunize susceptible infants to RSV. We're trying to decrease antibiotic exposure, especially early on in life, because that can definitely change your microbiome. Breastfeeding is always encouraged when possible. We know the more germs you are exposed to, you know, we've all seen that asthma, kind of the Hutterite Amish study looking at, you know, increased exposure to farm animals and germs is good. Trying to, you know, have a baby vaginally can help expose you to more germs um, than having a baby through a C-section when possible. In terms of allergens, we kind of talked about that last slide. 
And then air pollution, you know, there's only so much we can do, but we are trying in terms of smoking cessation, um, trying to decrease crowding in urban housing. There's all kinds of kind of things going on there. And where does this all intersect and what can we do about it? So there is in the U.S., there is at least one birth cohort, um, Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes, or ECHO, um, that's sponsored by the NIH. There are quite a few birth cohorts in Europe um, that are kind of looking very early on in life at many of these factors in infants to see what can we change. And then, as you know, we have medications for this as well. So this is a chart from a study last Last year, just looking at the relative effectiveness of different treatment classes of medications used solely for the management of allergic rhinitis. So this is not an all-inclusive list of medications that we use in our field. It's just specific to rhinitis here is kind of what we're looking at. And so nasal steroids, at least for the nasal symptoms, are the single most effective therapy that we have. But they don't do everything. As you can see when we look down at these ocular symptoms, nasal corticosteroids steroids don't have the greatest impact on ocular symptoms. And another downside to nasal steroids is it take a while to build. So if you look at this nasal antihistamine, great impacts on ocular symptoms, a little bit on the other stuff. In terms of oral antihistamines, leukotriene antagonists, plus minus on some things. Okay, so nasal steroid sprays, if you don't know this already, they are the most effective single therapy for allergic rhinitis, and they bind an intracellular glucocorticoid receptor, and they transcribe anti-inflammatory proteins, they suppress chemokines and cytokines, and they take a few hours and really need a few days for full effect. Um, they are more effective than oral antihistamines for relief of just about every single allergic rhinitis symptom. And dosing, you know, we really stress that they have to be used at least fairly consistent to work. They are not a PRN medication. In studies, if they're used at least 50% of days, they're pretty effective for seasonal allergic rhinitis, but we are really trying to get our patients to use them very consistently every day. In terms of adverse effects, the most common thing we really see is local irritation. So if you spray them, you know, the wrong direction, or you inhale very deeply, or whatever you're doing that's a little bit wrong for the technique, is and can cause some irritation, some sneezing, some burning, some nosebleeds sometimes. And there is, you know, very small but potential concern for growth suppression. We see this more in inhaled steroids, but there was a study of almost 500 kids age five to eight and a half who had perennial allergic rhinitis, and they were treated with two sprays in each nose daily of fluticasone for an entire year. And so this was a pretty high dose uh, for that age group, and they did have a reduction in growth velocity of 0.27 centimeters in that year. Um, they were not adrenally suppressed. There wasn't any change in their cortisol level, and there have been subsequent studies, especially with some of the newer nasal sprays that did not show any HPA suppression. One thing to note is if you have a CYP3A4 inhibitor like ritonavir um, or idraconazole, you can have some adrenal suppression if you are concurrently on a nasal steroid. Oral antihistamines. Um, if you want to get very nitpicky and nitty-gritty on their mechanism, they are really not antagonists of histamine. They are inverse agonists of the H1 receptor, and this shows up on boards sometimes. And so what they do when they bind is they shift from an active to an inactive form of that receptor. So they really do kind of turn it off, but if you want to be very picky, that is how they work. Um, they don't do anything for congestion, but they can help if you're itchy or sneezy or if your nose is a little bit runny. We tend to prefer the later medications as opposed to the earlier H1, kind of the first generation, because of lower CNS adverse effects. They peak within a few hours. Onset is within an hour. Um, they're less effective than nasal steroids, but equally are more effective than nasal chromalin, which we'll also talk about because it has its use. They can be a little bit sedating, satirizing more so than the others, and can cause some dry eyes. Um, Often we'll see families come in and they'll say, you know, we did Satirzy, but then it kind of stopped working and it wore off and we feel like he just got used to it, so we switched. There's really no evidence that that exists um, in terms of pharmacologic tolerance. Nasal antihistamines can be great if you can tolerate the taste. Um, so we have two. We have azelastine um, and olopatadine, and they are approved down to a pretty young age. When I did this talk last year, it was six years and 12 years, but now it's six months and six years. And so you can use Astelin or azelastine or whatever brand in a much younger kid if you want to. 
primarily for congestion. That's what it's best at. It is very rapid. This can be a PRN, but they taste quite bitter, and they try to kind of saccharinate it over time, and then it's kind of sweet, bitter, and kids just don't tend to like it. Um, but adults and other people feel that it is very, very helpful. A leukotriene receptor antagonist, when we are talking about rhinitis, we're really only talking about Montelukast, um, and that's approved for age six months and up. For perennial allergic rhinitis, they block the cis-LT1 receptor to reduce congestion, and that's really about all that it does. It does not have any effect on sneezing or itching. Um, similar in efficacy to loratadine in a systematic review and inferior to nasal steroids, as just about everything is. Um, their use, you know, it might benefit people if they can't tolerate a nasal spray, but it shouldn't really be offered as a first-line primary therapy just for rhinitis. And adverse effects, um, now that there is a black box warning for this, I think we're all a little bit more familiar with the adverse effects of Montelukast, um, but they can have pretty decent neuropsychiatric side effects involving behavior and dreams. Um, so that's something to note. Nasal chromalin, I think, definitely still has its purpose. Um, it is a mast cell stabilizer that inhibits histamine and other mediator release by inhibiting chloride channels. It's very rapid. It works quickly, but you have to dose it every four to six hours. So it's not super convenient. But if you, if you have someone, say, who is allergic to a cat and they are going to a house with cats, um, this can be a pretty useful use it before you go, repeat it every few hours while you're there um, type of medication. Um, it is, as with everything else, inferior to nasal steroids, but it has not been studied head-to-head -head versus any other allergy medication. And it's very safe. A little bit of local irritation, maybe headache, but beyond that, there's no great side effects of note, and it is an over-the-counter medication. In terms of combo therapy, I think that, you know, we all usually prescribe, you know, if nasal steroids don't work on their own, we typically prescribe something else with it. Um, for the ARIA guidelines for perennial allergic rhinitis, Adding a nasal antihistamine to a nasal steroid um, is typically more appropriate and works better than adding an oral antihistamine. Um, versus seasonal allergic rhinitis, they basically say, you know, add something else and see how it goes. Uh, Flutigazone is the last name, sorry for the extra F there, um, is our only in the United States nasal combination spray that we've got. Um, and it works quite well. It has superior efficacy and in inhibition of IL-6 versus placebo or versus either medication alone. Um, when you have it in combination, it definitely saves liquid. Um, it's a lower volume um, being instilled into the nostril, and it's approved for age 6 plus and studied down to age 4. But the main hindrance to this, even though there is currently a generic out there as well, is generally cost and insurance coverage. We all know allergen immunotherapy is awesome. It is the really only therapy that we have that really changes your immune system um, to make a long-lasting benefit to help you tolerate your allergen versus medications that are just, you know, masking symptoms and helping you feel better and turning off the process temporarily. So immunotherapy is great, um, and its goal is to develop immune tolerance to the allergen. So Early on, what you see is you want early desensitization of your mast cells and your basophils to make them less twitchy upon exposure to the allergen with the eventual goal of inducing tolerogenic dendritic cells. And so the way that you do that is with your T-regulatory cells. So they release IL-10 and TGF-beta. They're going to suppress your inflammatory dendritic cell and they're going to suppress your kind of Th2 cells as well. And then they're also going to interact with this inducible B regulatory cell to bump up your IgG4 levels and suppress your IgE levels. And then you get tolerance and everyone is happy, but this takes many years sometimes to happen. So the benefit, you know, it takes a lot of time for it to happen, but you might have a sustainable benefit for many, many years after discontinuation of treatment. And unfortunately, there is no great biomarker or test to determine who is going to receive the longest benefit or the greatest benefit. We just know that immunotherapy works pretty great for pollen, pretty decently for pets, less so for mold, but still worth trying. Um, IT might prevent development of new allergen sensitization, and it may reduce the risk of developing allergic asthma in those who do not yet have it. Um, skit can improve quality of life. It can help with a nasal provocation challenge. And generally, over time, it's not any more costly than pharmacotherapy over the course of treatment. So if cost is a hindrance, know that, you know, it, I guess depending on insurance and coverage and other things, it does tend to balance out cost-wise. 
We do have some sublingual products available in the United States. Um, there are four of them, and so this is just a nice chart looking at the ages of approval. If you have printed slides from yesterday, know that the oral air second column is now approved down to age five, which is different from when I gave this talk last year. Um, and so this is just some info there. You cannot start split if you have severe, unstable, or uncontrolled asthma. If you have, and this is in the packaging, any severe systemic allergic reaction, any severe local reaction after taking slit, if you have hypersensitivity to the inactive ingredients in the product, know that most contain fish gelatin, or if you have a history of eosinophilic esophagitis, because this can either, you know, unmask or create an EOE-like syndrome. In terms of efficacy, there's really not been a great head-to-head -head study, but in 2016, they did an indirect comparison via a pooled analysis, taking a look at improvement either seasonally with grass or ragweed products or perennially with the house decimate product, improvement in your total nasal symptom score. If you look in the seasonal column here, a grass tablet had a 16% improvement, ragweed 17% improvement. Momentazone nasal spray actually had the highest improvement and performed better in this indirect comparison study than either of the seasonal products. So I thought that was interesting. But if you look at the dust mite tablet for year-round symptoms, um, the dust mite tablet did score better than any of the monotherapies alone. Um, and know that it might provide additional benefit after cessation of therapy. So they did a study on the dust mite tablet and found that after four years of taking this, you actually got eight years of benefit. Um, and so you might be able to come off for, you know, a few years, go back on for a few years if that's something that your patients are interested in. Other therapies, there's no biologic for allergic rhinitis, but it's kind of a bystander diagnosis that improves on some biologic therapies. So dupilumab, um, which we know is approved for a few different uses, can improve a SNAP22 allergic rhinitis score in every aspect of perennial allergic rhinitis, including congestion and drainage and sneezing, at a dose of 300Q2 in patients who have asthma um, and a positive IgE to a perennial allergen. So it is helpful and useful. There are, you know, other targets. We've talked about other molecules in this talk, and so there are studies of CRTH2 small molecule inhibitors um, that are being evaluated, which are interesting. And then these ILC2 cells are a target. Um, there are drugs like Remetriban, which is a small molecule antagonist. Um, Montelukast actually helps inhibit these cell types as well. Um, and so there are you know, people look at ILC2 activation in response to immunotherapy to house dust mite, and those are definitely decreased as well. Epigenomics are also an area that we talked about that is being studied, specifically these HDAC or the histone deacetylase molecules. They're actually making, like, little small molecule medications to target the activity of this enzyme, and they've studied it in mice. And when they treated cultured nasal cells uh, of human, human cells or kind of in vivo in mice, um, it led to normal mucosal function. So it actually healed their mucosal barrier. Um, and we know that HDAC inhibitors prevent allergic rhinitis in mice. And so very interesting. Um, there might be something to this, um, but more to come. So in brief, Allergic rhinitis is increasingly prevalent and can definitely affect quality of life. Allergens are not as harmless as we may have previously thought. Like just about everything we study, it's a Th2-mediated disease with a complex interplay between the innate and the adaptive immune systems. We're looking a lot more at the exposome and the microbiome. Environmental alterations can result in epigenetic modifications skewing toward a Th2 process. And the more we learn about it, the more potential new targets that we have. So here are some links. I'm happy to send them, but really just Google them, and they're out there um, to some good rhinitis guidelines. Thank you, Paul. That was great. Um, uh, put quite a lot in that time through that you had. Thank you for doing that. <clears throat> um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Polk? I will accept any question, even if you think it's silly. Please ask. Or if you don't have any, that's totally cool, too. I think you told a everybody this morning. Um, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> Hit you with some knowledge points. Take them home. <laughs> okay. 
Well, All right, uh, we'll let you go. Um, thank you again for taking the time to do this today. We really yeah. appreciate it. Um, and do have a great week, okay? And keep safe. Thanks, you too. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.